My name is Lorna Monty Burdick, and I'm an herbalist here in Atlanta, Georgia. One of the big projects we have going on here in Atlanta is called the Herbalista Health Network, and we are a collection of free clinics and educational and service-oriented programming that involves the community. So I'm standing here with Ambrosia trifida. There's about 50 plants in the Ambrosia genus. In Atlanta, we have two. We have the trifida, this one here, which gets its name from the fact the leaves often have three lobes. And there's also the ambrosia artemisia folia, which is, I would say, better known in the herbal world. However, I do work with the trifida as well. So this plant's common name is ragweed, and it's known as greater ragweed because it's ginormous. This plant will grow 13 feet. I've heard it can grow up to 20 feet. Usually in Atlanta, the stands are about 13 to 15 max is what I've seen. So this here looks about, you know, halfway grown. Um, it's going to start flowering in August. It'll flower for a couple months and it will produce lots and lots of allergic reactions in people. Um, the flowers are in racemes and they're not very colorful. They're kind of a, a pale greenish color, and so it's not meant for pollinators to be attracted to it and then spread the pollen around. Instead, the particles are very, very tiny, and when the wind blows by, it sends the particles airborne. I've heard that they can stay airborne for weeks at a time and travel hundreds of miles of distance. Um, so it's a pretty successful plant. For that reason, it's known as a weed. I mean, you're gonna see it everywhere. We have overabundance of ragweed in the Atlanta area, which is terrible for those who suffer from allergies, but you know, really great as an herbalist and wild crafter because I don't have to worry about impacting this plant community. I know that I can freely harvest from it as much as I like, make as much medicine as I need to serve, and that's gonna be fine. I typically harvest it before it goes into flower. I don't believe that the allergen, which is carried in the pollen, a protein, gets transferred to a tincture. Um, so I do know a lot of people who will make medicine from this plant after it's gone to flower, but I think why mess around with it? Why instill that possible concern in a patient if they do have allergy to ragweed and you want to use this plant with them? If you give them that reassurance that we made the medicine before it went to flower, before the pollen was produced, I think that's just reassuring and that in itself is good medicine. So we use this medicine as an antihistamine, so actually to help with allergies. And it's been used in a couple ways. Um, the way I work with it as an herbalist is again, I tincture up the leaves and I make, it, make a nice extract that I'll give to people either leading in to allergy season on a regular basis or if they're currently experiencing allergies, you can give it to them in that acute situation to help tamp that down. But currently, they're also, I think it was maybe two years ago, they released the first sublingual anti-ragweed allergy. It's Merck is the company that produced it, and they're actually taking the pollen itself. So it's like giving immunotherapy, how it's normally done with shots, they're doing it now as a sublingual, um, and you know, having a lot of good results with that. So you could work with the pollen in that type of way, at least that's what Merck's doing. I instead work with the leaves and work with their anti-inflammatory effects, um, their antihistaminic effects. I think if you would to look this up and try to find historical records, you would find that as this is a plant that's native to the Americas, there's a lot of tribes that worked with it. The Cherokee, who is North Georgia, um, so not far from where Atlanta is, definitely utilized it. And you can look in some of the old texts, like Mormon's collection, and find references probably eight different tribes scattered around the United States who are all working with this plant. Um, and they'll list things even having to do with childbirth or difficult menses, um, but definitely it's been used a lot topically for bites and stings, and again, that's that inflammation that's being reduced. Uh, so 
you could use this externally and to be honest I haven't done that so you know if I grab a plantain leaf this could be something that I would use in its stead and I would like to experiment with that myself but again I like to use this internally as a tincture and so when I'm making medicine I would come about now it's before the flowering seasons happen you could even into June and July do this I would harvest the plant and then I would take just the leaves and I would tincture those up at a one to two ratio of 95%. Chopping the leaves up really fine, you can either take the leaves and kind of roll them up and then use a big knife on a cutting board and just mince it really small. Uh, if you want to just spend time tearing and meditating on the plant, of course you can do that too, but the point is to expose a lot of surface area and to rupture a lot of cell membranes. Um, and then again, 95%, so that's straight ethanol, 190 proof, pour that in, seal that up, and then about two weeks later you can press out your medicine. For dosing, I think it really depends on what the scenario is. If you're trying to tamp down like a current really acute situation, I've used up to five milliliters, which is one teaspoon as a loading dose, and then maintain that through smaller doses, you know, maybe half teaspoon doses or a couple of half dropper folds, AKA squirts as I like to call them. I would like to compare this and contrast this with a couple other plants that you might utilize as well. So Atlanta is very famous for allergies. I mean, I think it has to do a combination with, we have lots of flowering plants here. We're a bit of a temperate rainforest in a way. And we've also got really poor air quality that's come from our excessive traffic. So when you put those two things together, um, so many people, they move to Atlanta and then all of a sudden have allergies who've never had them their whole life. So having a lot of different options to deal with allergies is important. So ragweed is one that I use. And I would say that I use that fairly interchangeably with how I would use something like nettles tincture, which until I started working with ragweed was something I would go to to help tamp down allergies in an immediate sense or again utilizing it over time to help get somebody ready for allergy season. I also would use something like Quercetin, and I've had a lot of great results from that, but what I found is, is that quercetin isn't as fast acting in the moment, whereas this will be. If you give somebody, if you give somebody some tincture, you can expect them to start feeling a difference, you know, in as little as five minutes. Whereas the quercetin could take half an hour, an hour for someone to start really feeling the effects. So that doesn't mean you can't use them in tandem, and I often do. You might give somebody a quercetin capsule and in the meantime, start tamping down with some ambrosia and then that quercetin they can kind of coast on for the day. So it's a very safe herb. I haven't noticed uh, any side effects or any kind of contraindications or interactions, except of course we have like the one standard of the pollen itself does produce allergies in people. Um, but other than that, I find it a very safe plant. They're starting to do a little bit of research on it. So you can find, you know, some articles in PubMed, for example, uh, usually a lot of the testing, again, is done on the other species, which is the Artemisia folia. Um, and that one has its name because the leaves are extremely, um, extremely cut and feather-like, so it reminds one of Artemisia, the genus. Um, but they are doing some work into the Trifida as well. And it's one that is so super abundant in Atlanta. And because they grow so large, it just makes an abundance of medicine. So this is the one I've been focusing on working with more regularly than the other species. So there's a lot of choices you can make when you decide you're ready to gather some ambrosia. To be honest, because it's not such a concern with the plant population, it is abundant, abundant, abundant. Like if you look it up on one of those databases where one is really endangered and rare and five is like, oh dear, we have so much of this, we don't know what to do, it's a five. Probably the quickest, easiest way would be to just grab yourself several stalks. So you would just cut towards the bottom. Um, so again, you know, you want to harvest the part of the plant that's still looking good. And then you can take it home and then you would remove the leaves, discard the stem, and the leaves are what you would tincture up.
because it's wind pollinated. 